Hello everybody and welcome to Appalachian Cemetery Hunting with Robin. This is Greg once again. In this video we're going to be going a little bit outside our territory. Matter of fact we're going to New Haven, Connecticut. We're going to be looking at the center church on the Green Churchyard. Now this uh, church is actually on the National Historic Landmarks Register. Center Church on the Green is situated right on the New Haven Green itself and it is the oldest church in New Haven. And it was founded in 1638 and was previously known as First Congregational Church. The present building dates from 1814 and was built over part of the burying ground. Now there are still graves in the basement crypt to this day. Many people were buried on the green. As a matter of fact, it was on, actually on top of an old colonial cemetery containing between 5,000 and 10,000 New Haven settlers. In 1821, almost all the remaining outside monuments were moved to the Grove Street Cemetery. And the tombstones that were moved from the Center Church Cemetery are along the inside wall in alphabetical order at the Grove Street Cemetery. In this video, we will be looking at some of the history of New Haven, as well as some of the people buried here. However, there are 628 people listed for this cemetery on findagrave.com, and many of them do not have a picture of their headstone. So for the sake of time, we will only be looking at those I could find some history on, whether they have a grave marker or not. So let's get started. New Haven is in South Central Connecticut, and it is a port on Long Island Sound at the mouth of the Quinnipiac River. Originally settled as Quinnipiac in 1638 by a company of English Puritans led by John Davenport and Theophilus Eaton. It was renamed in 1640, probably for New Haven, England. In 1643, it combined with several adjacent towns, including Milford and Guilford, to form the New Haven Colony, of which Eaton was governor until his death in 1658. It is also the home of Yale University. And here are some images of early New Haven. Now, this is a map of the New Haven Colony's boundaries from 1636 to 1776. This is a drawing of the first New Haven meeting house that was built in 1639. Here is the second meeting house, and it was built in 1685. Now this is an oil painting by William Munson that was done in 1830, and it shows the town's third meeting house on your left, and it was built in 1757. This postcard from 1908 shows the fourth meeting house built in 1814, and it is the current center church on the green. And this is an aerial shot of the center church, and you'll notice that there are two churches on either side of it. This is the main entrance of the church. And here's a picture of the current sanctuary, which was built, of course, in 1814. Now, folks, you've got to admit, they really knew how to build churches back then. Here's a picture of the church's organs and pipes. And this stained glass picture behind the, is behind the pulpit. Now, the plaque in this picture is on the outside of the church. I'm going to try to read it for you. From the settlement of New Haven, 1638 to 1796, the adjoining ground was occupied as a common place of burial. Then a new burying ground was opened and divided into family lots and city squares. In 1813, this church was placed over the monuments of several whose names are engraved on tablets in the vestibule. In 1821, the remaining monuments were, were, by consent of survivors and under the direction of the city, removed to the new burying ground. Now, the last two lines are from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 52. And it says, In a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the dead shall be raised. Now, the plaque in this picture is actually down in the crypt itself. I'm going to try to read it. The ground covered by this edifice is a portion of the original burying place 
New Haven used from 1638 until 1821. The earliest date of a burial inscribed on these old stones is in 1687, and the latest is 1812. In 1821, the graves outside of these walls were leveled, and the monuments and headstones were moved to the Grove Street Cemetery. And at the bottom of the plaque, it says, This crypt was restored in 1879. The first meeting house of this society was erected in 1639. The second in 1668. The third in 1757. And the present church was dedicated on December 27, 1814. Now here we have four pictures of inside the crypt itself. Now, it's my understanding that the bodies are still in the graves inside the crypt. Now, let's get started on learning about some of the people who are buried here. First, we have Isaac Allerton, 1586 to 1659. And he was one of the pilgrims who came to the New World for religious freedom in 1620. And as you know, they sailed on board the Mayflower. Before they went ashore, they wrote and signed the Mayflower Compact, as depicted in this painting. Isaac Allerton was the fifth signer of the compact, as shown on this transcript. Now, the original Mayflower Compact has been lost, perhaps falling victim to Revolutionary War looting. Here is an engraving of the pilgrims landing on Plymouth Rock. Allerton was Governor Bradford's assistant and in 1627 was elected by the colonists to return to London, England to negotiate the Plymouth Colony's buyout of the merchant adventurers, the investors who had originally funded the colony. His first wife, Mary Norris Allerton, was the first person to give birth in the Plymouth Colony. And she died the first year after landing at Plymouth and is buried there. And here's a photo of the Mayflower II at State Pier in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And this picture was taken in 2006. This reproduction was built in Devon, England between 1955 and 1956. The ship is considered a faithful, generic reproduction. It is 106 feet long by 20 feet wide, 25 feet wide, excuse me, and displaces 236 tons. Has, it has three masts, a bowsprit, and six sails. Now, to give an idea of how small the Mayflower really was, notice the couple standing along the rail midship on the port side. Now imagine the pilgrims ship's crew being squeezed on board during their journey. This plaque is on the center church and states that Allerton was buried on the green and was the only member of the Mayflower Company to be buried in Connecticut, and there is no picture of his headstone. Next we have Captain Daniel Alling, 1688 to 1756 and he was commissioned to captain the 6th Company of Train Man in the town of New Haven in October of 1735. Now back then, train bands were basically civilian militias in the colonies. This is an English character of a train band from 1777. And these militias were the forerunners of today's National Guard. And there is no picture of Alling's headstone. Next, we have Fitch Alling, 1754 to 1777, and his headstone is in the church's crypt, and I hope you can see the writing on the stone. Next, we have Mary Whiting Alling, 1715 to 1748, and this is also down in the crypt. The inscription reads, and I love the way they did the spelling back then, but it reads, 
Here lie interred the body of Mrs. Mary, the wife of Mr. Step Alling, who died April 3rd, 1748, aged 33 years. And I hope you can see the a carbon on this one too. Next, we have Phoebe Whiting Alling, 1720 to 1751. Now we have Roger Alling, 1612 to 1674. And this photo was taken at the Grove Street Cemetery where they moved many of the headstones. Roger came to America in 1638 at about 26 years of age on an unnamed ship with the Lamberton Company. He was not an original planner, Quinnipiac, of course, that's New Haven. Since he signed the fundamental agreement in about 1641, which was later than the original signers. He was, however, an early landowner and an important person in the affairs of the colony. His occupation was that of blacksmith, which was the same as his father and his father-in-law, Thomas Nash. And Roger Alling married Mary Nash in about 1642 in New Haven. Now we have William Andrews, 1600 to 1676. He was an innkeeper and a founder of this church, and there is no picture of his headstone. Now we have Margaret Mansfield Arnold, 1745 to 1775. She was the first wife of Benedict Arnold. Yes, that Benedict Arnold. Now we have David Atwater, 1615 to 1692, and there is no picture of his headstone. King Charles II spent, sent troops to capture the regicides who had condemned his father, Charles I. Among those pursued were judges Wally, or Lally, and Golf, who came to America in 1660, and after being concealed by Mr. Davenport, hidden in what was called, later called the Judge's Cave in West Rock on the land owned by David Atwater, who left food for them daily, and they were never captured. Next, we have Jonathan Atwater, 1656 to 1726. He was a, a, a successful merchant in New Haven with a large estate of about 15,323 pounds equal to half of the value of all the estates in New Haven at that time. And it included 4,000 acres of land and goods to stock a retail store. Jonathan Atwater of New Haven paid William Maltby of Branford to build the brigantine called the Friends Adventure. And there is no picture of his grave. Now we have David Austin, 1732 to 1801. His headstone is in the Grove Street Cemetery in New Haven. Now we have John Ball, 1695 to 1741. And the inscription on his headstone reads, Here lies the body of John Ball who died January 22nd, A.D. 1741, in 46 years of his age. I love the way they worded these uh, uh, the words on uh, these old tombstones and, and the spelling on it. Next we have Mary Ball and uh, we have no uh, date, birth date but she died on September 23rd, 1790 something, I can't tell. And the inscription reads, in memory of Mary Ball, relic of John Ball and the late relic of D, maybe possibly Deacon, John Punderson, and we don't know about the spelling on that. And again, she died on September 23rd, 1790 something or other. Again, we just have no idea. Now we have Sarah Bradley Beecher, 1710 to 1756. There is no picture of her grave, but here's a photo of an unfinished needlework sampler for her grandchild, Ella Follett. I hope I spelled that right or said that right. It's spelled E-L-I-P-H-A-L-E-T. His wife and marriage date and their daughter, Alice. And I'm so surprised that this has lasted so long. 
Now we have Anna Peck Bishop, 1745-1797. And the memorial stone for both Ezra Bishop that we just did, that we just mentioned above a few minutes ago and Hannah Bishop at the Grove Street Cemetery, New Haven, Connecticut. Now we have John Blakely. We have no birth date, but he was he died in 1742. And the inscription reads, Here lies ye body of Mr. John Blakesley. Blakesley, I guess I hope I'm pronouncing that. Died April 30th, 1742. And that's where the, where the inscription ends. Next, we have Hannah Miles Bradley, 1732 to 1786. And the inscription reads, Consort of Mr. Joseph Bradley in the 50th fourth year of her age. Now from the 17th to the 19th centuries, consort was, was usually used on the graves of women, although a man could also be a consort. And the word consort was normally used in this manner. It meant that the wife had died before her husband did. Now we have John Brockett, 1609 to 1689. And he is listed as the 15th member of the Center Church on the Green along with his wife and daughter. He was the one that originally designed and laid out the town. He attended Cambridge and married Mary Blackwell, August 14, 1635, at Sandbridge. And he sailed to the American colonies to throw his lot with the Reverend John Davenport and Theophilus Eaton, Puritans from England. Next, we have John Cooper, 1612 to 1689. Now, there is no picture of his headstone, but there is some information about him on findagrave.com. It said he emigrated to Lynn, Massachusetts on the ship Expedition in 1635. He subscribed to the New Haven Fundamental Agreement on June 4th, 1639. In the same year, he was an agent for the Iron Works he was admitted as a freeman on October 22, 1645, in New Haven. He traveled with John Woolen, who lived in New Haven, to Delaware Bay to interpret in his dealings with the Indians. He was appointed to be a chimney inspector from 1643 to 1649. He also served as a surveyor of highways, constable of New Haven, a pounder of stray livestock, and a townsman for 27 years. In 1644, he was fined for coming late to a meeting with his arms, and again in 1647 for not having a gun rest. Needless to say, they were pretty strict back then. And he was also a deputy to the General Court at Hartford for New Haven for several years. And this guy seemed like he was quite a character. Next, we have Hester Coster. We have no birth year for her, but she died in 1691. And her headstone says she was 67 years old when she died. So she was probably born around 1624. Next, we have Catherine Dana. Again, no birth year, but she did die in 1795. And I'll extend this segment to give you time to read the inscription on the headstone. And one thing you've got to remember uh, while you read this, that in the 18th century, lots of times the S's were written like F. Now we have Abigail Pearson Davenport, 1643 to 1717. And I'll give you some time to read this inscription too.
on her stone, you'll notice the term relic. This simply means she was a widow when she passed away. Now we have Abraham Dickerman, 1673 to 1748. In 1705, he was chosen as a constable. Now we have Isaac Dickerman, Jr., 1714 to 1740. And he received a Bachelor of Arts degree from Yale College in 1736. Now we have Deacon Isaac Dickerman, 1677 to 1758. Isaac was a deacon at the First Church, now Center Church, until he left and joined the White Church, which is the Second Church, on April 2nd, 1754. And he left the church a silver, a silver Paul Revere cup at his death. He was a captain of the train band and a representative, or deputy representative, excuse me, to the General Assembly in Hartford for many terms. Although his tombstone is nowhere to be found, but it is said to be in a house in New Haven in the 19, as, of, as late as the 1960s. And the picture shows a monument in the Grove Street Cemetery, which includes Isaac, Abraham, and Thomas Dickerman. Next, we have John Dixwell, 1607 to 1689. And he was born in England and was one of the regicide judges who signed the death warrant for King Charles I. The regicides of Charles I generally refers to the 59 commissioners who signed the warrant for the execution of the king in January of 1649. This followed his conviction for treason by the High Court of Justice. Now, a regicide is a person who kills or takes part in the killing of a king. Dixwell went into exile in the New World, sailing in New Haven, and assumed the name James Davids. Now this is a sketch of his original headstone. And this monument was erected in 1849 by his descendants and is behind Center Church. Now we have Mary Porter Edwards, 1748 to 1782. And the inscription on her headstone says she drowned due to a carriage accident. Next, we have Mary Forbes. We have no birth date on her, but she died in 1784. Now, this market is in remembrance of her and is located in the Grove Street Cemetery in New Haven. Now, we have Matthew Gilbert II. 1615 to 1680. He was born in England and arrived in Boston in 1637, then migrated to the New Haven Colony in 1638. He was one of seven men appointed to form the New Haven Colony in 1639, and he was deputy governor of the colony from 1661 to 1663, and has a stone marker that's marked M.G. 1680. Next, we have Matthew Gilbert III, 1655 to 1711. And he was the first deputy governor of the colony of Connecticut and deacon of the First Church, and was also a justice of the peace in New Haven. Now we have Michael Gilbert, 1735 to 1779. And he was on the muster roll of the 17th Military Company in the 2nd Regiment of Militia as a private. He was killed in action when the British forces under General Tryon invaded New Haven on July 5, 1779. And his brother, Captain John Gilbert, was also killed. Next, we have Colonel William Goff, G-O-F-F-E. I hope I pronounced that right. 1618 to 1680. And he was another regicide who signed the death warrant of King Charles I of England. And you can see his signature here on the document underlined in red. 
and here's a sketch of his grave marker. The M is an inversion of the letter of his first name, W, but I have no idea why that was done. Next, we have John Goodyear, 1651 to 1702. There are no pictures or drawings of his grave site, and this map shows how New Haven looked in 1640. This drawing is at the first meeting house in New Haven, and this is where John and his parents attended church, and I believe it was located where the modern Sarah Church on the Green stands today. Next, we have Stephen Goodyear, 1598, 1658. There is no picture of his grave. This, what we're showing here is a cenotaph on the outside of the center church. The time of his arrival in America is unknown, but it is known that he owned the vessel St. John that sailed from Bristol, England to New Haven and was licensed to transport 250 persons and he was listed as a passenger. He was a merchant, a large landowner, and trader who lived in New Haven. His estate in 1643 was worth 100 pounds, and he owned land totaling approximately 939 acres in the area known as Meadow in the Neck. And the location of his actual farm was north of New Haven in the neighborhood of Pine Rock. On July 1st, 1644, he was administered the oath of fidelity by Theophilus Eaton, who was chosen governor of New Haven Colony annually for many years, along with Stephen Goodyear, who was chosen deputy governor. They had no salary, but served the people for the honor of it and the general good, is what I saw a quote as saying. He also served as commissioner for, for the United Colonies from 1643 to 1646. In 1644, he built a trading post on Goodyear's Island at the cove below Falls Mountain for the purpose of trading with the Indians. Mr. Goodyear was a member of the Company of Merchants of New Haven, or the Ship Company, which was established to direct trade with the mother country, of course, which was England. Their plan was to build a ship, fill the goods for trading, and sell it to London. Month after month, with no word from the ship, despair set in with the inhabitants of New Haven. In November 1647, the estates of those lost in what was also called the Phantom Ship were settled, and they were recorded as deceased. And this includes Stephen Goodyear's wife, Mary. The first ironworks in Connecticut was established in the town of East Haven in 1655 by Stephen Goodyear and continued for about 25 years. Stephen Goodyear died in London, England in 1658. I'm not sure if his monument is in London or if it is another cenotaph in New Haven. Next, we have Hezekiah Gorham, 16, or excuse me, 1725 to 1790. He enlisted in Captain Phineas Bradley's company of Matrosses. That's M-A-T-R-O-S-S-E-S. -S -E and I guess that means artillery. Raised for the defense of New Haven during the War of the Revolution on March 26, 1779. Here we have a mother and daughter that are buried next to each other. Catherine Greenall, we have no uh, birth date on her, but she died in November of 1758, who is the mother and has the larger headstone. And her daughter, also named Catherine, again, no birth date, but she died in September of 1758. And like I said, that's the daughter and she has the smaller headstone. And like I said, as you see, she was named after her mother and passed away two months earlier. Next, we have William Greenall. Uh, no birth date on him, but he died in 1791. Next, we have Rutherford Hall, 1675 to 1703. Now we have Margaret Pick Harrison, 1598 to 1655. 
She was the daughter of Thomas Pick and Mary Rathbone. Margaret married Richard Harrison, and she immigrated to America between 1620 and 1640 with her parents. And they were one of the first settlers in America. And her husband, Richard Harrison II, who lived from 1595 to 1665. Now we have Rebecca Russell Hayes, 1723 to 1773. And the inscription on her stone reads, Mrs. Rebecca Hayes, the amiable and virtuous consort of Captain Ezekiel Hayes and daughter of Colonel John Russell, departed this life May 27, 1773, in the 51st year of her age. Now we have Nathaniel Eaton, Jr., 1704 to 1782. Now we have James Abraham Hillhouse, 1730 to 1775, and his wife, Mary Lucas Hillhouse, 1735 to 1822. And the inscription reads, Sacred to the memory of James Abraham Hillhouse, who died October 3rd, 1775. Also his wife, Mary Lucas, who died June 20th, 1822, aged 89. And here's a portrait of her. And this picture is a side view of their ledger stone. Next, we have John Hitchcock, no birth year, but we do know he died in 1733. And the inscription reads, In memory of Deacon John Hitchcock, Esquire, who died October the 14th, 1733, aged 68 years. Next, we have Matthias, and he went by Matthew Hitchcock, 1610 to 1669. He came to the Massachusetts Bay in 1635 on a ship Susan and Ellen. He first settled in Watertown and moved to Cambridge in 1637 and then to New Haven by 1639. Now we have John Odcho. Uh, we don't know when he was born, but he did die in 1690. Now we have Samuel Hotchkiss the first. 1623 to 1663, and he was originally from Shop, Shropshire, England. I knew I'd mess that up. Next, we have Thomas Hotchkiss, 1654 to 1711, and he was a sergeant in the colonial militia. His gravestone was moved to a wall at Grove Street Cemetery, and his body remains on the New Haven Green behind Center Church. Now we have Hannah Hitchcock Howell, 1748 to 1787. Now we have Judge John Hubbard, 1703 to 1773. And he received an MA degree from Yale College in 1730 and was representative to the General Court of New Haven and a judge of the probate court and he served as a lieutenant colonel in the French and Indian War and was a poet. Now we have John Hyde. We don't know when he was born, but he died in 1794. Next, we have Jared Ingersoll, 1722 to 1781. And he graduated from Yale College in 1742 and was chosen as stamp master general for the New England colonies under George III. At this time, several demonstrations against the Stamp Act was taking place across the colony. Mr. Ingersoll had been assured of the governor's protection and tried to persuade the colonists to persevere. A group of demonstrators surrounded his house and demanded that he resign. He, agree he did agree to offer his resignation but this didn't satisfy some of them. 
In order to prevent his home from being attacked, he rode on horseback to place himself under the protection of the legislature at Hartford. Before reaching Wethersfield, however, he met about 500 men on horseback and rode with them to Wethersfield when they compelled him to resign again. He finally made a written resignation and he was escorted to Hartford where he read the paper to the assembly. In about 1770, he was appointed an admiralty judge in the Middle District and he resided in Philadelphia for a time but returned to New Haven. Next, we have Amelia Broom Jarvis, 1764 to 1788. Now we have Philip Leake I, 1611 to 1676. In March of 17, or excuse me, in March of 1645, he was chosen corporal of the train band, and then resided, he resigned that office on May 10, 1652. And then he was chosen constable on January 9th of 1670. Next, we have Sarah Whiting Wyman, 1725 to 1751. Now we have Sarah Wyman, 1750 to 1751. And now we have another Sarah Lyman, and she was born and died in 1749, and she was just one month old. Next, we have Louisa Caroline Strobel Martin, 1806 to 1883. Now we have Warham, it's W-A-R-H-A-M, Mather, 1666 to 1745. Now, after graduating from Harvard, he moved to New Haven, where he tried the ministry, medicine, and the law. He failed at the first two, but had some success as a lawyer. And if that last name sounds familiar, his cousin was Cotton Mather, who was heavily involved in the Salem Witch Trials in the 1690s. Next, we have Captain John Miles, 1644 to 1705. He was appointed captain of 150 men raised for the relief of Albany on February 21, 1693. He later served as deputy for New Haven to Connecticut General Court from October of 1690 to May of 1691. Now we have Judge Richard Miles, 1598 to 1667 and his wife, Mary, Catherine, I hope I'm gonna try to pronounce this right, Elithorpe Miles, and her maiden name was spelled E-L-I-T-H-O-R-P-E. And she lived from 1592 to 1688. This stone in this picture is on the Memorial Bridge over the Wepawag River, and hope I pronounced that one right too, in Milford, honoring Richard and Catherine Miles as founders of Milford. Richard became a free man in 1639 and was appointed judge in New Milford in 1640. He was administered the oath of fidelity by Governor Theophilus Eaton on July 1st, 1644, and was appointed clerk to the New Haven Artillery Company in 1648. He was a deacon of the First Church in New Haven from 1656 to 1667 and performed many jobs for the colony. He worked on the first seagoing ship from New Haven, which many people called the Phantom Ship, which sank on its first voyage when many of New Haven's finest died. In 1646, Sister Miles was assigned to sit in the fourth seat in the women's section in the middle seats of the meeting house talk about some strict rules they had back then. Next, we have John Mix, 1737 to 1742. And according to Fine of Grave, he shares this grave with his sister, Anne, who also died in 1742. Now we have Thomas Nash, 1589 to 1658. 
He was an original settler of New Haven, and he was a blacksmith and a gunsmith. Now we have the Reverend Joseph Noyes, it's N-O-Y-E-S, I hope I can get, I hope I pronounce that right, 1688 to 1761. And according to the plaque, he was a graduate of an instructor at Yale University. He was also pastor at the Center Church from 1716 to 1761. Now we have Joseph Hayes Noyes, February of 1728 to April of 1728. He he was just eight weeks old. Now we have Mary Hillhouse, excuse me, Hillhouse Oswald, 1774 to 1778. Now we have William Party, 1773 to 1774. Elizabeth Parmalee. 1770 to 1794. Next, we have our, excuse me, Abigail Parmalee, and her birth and death dates cannot be read. Now we have Abigail Davenport Pierpoint, 1672 to 1692. Next is James Pierpoint, 1699 to 1776. And now we have the Reverend James Pierpoint, 1659 to 1740. He graduated from Harvard in 1681 and was ordained on July 2nd, 1685. Later, he became a, a, what they called an eminent divine and he was connected with Yale College in various capacities. He was a founder a trust, and trustee um, on October 16th of 1701 to November 22nd of 1714 and a professor of moral philosophy. Now we have a couple of sisters, Sarah Pierpoint, 1769 to 1772, and Polly Pierpoint, February of 1776 to September of 1776. Next, we have Sarah Haynes Pierpoint, 1673 to 1696, and she was the wife of Reverend James Pierpoint. Now we have Mary Hooker Pierpoint, 1673 to 1740, and she was the third wife of Reverend James Pierpoint. Here's a picture of a book she owned in 1726, and it was written in London, England, in 1658. And this inscription was written by her in 1728. I always like finding stuff like that. Next, we have Captain John Prout, 1649 to 1719. And the inscription on his ledger stone reads, Here lieth the interred, here lieth, excuse me, I'll try that again. Here lieth interred the body of Captain John Prout, who departed this life September ye 20th, 1719. And in Latin it says, at the age of 70 years. Next we have Margaret Prout, we do not know when she was born, but she did die in 1794. Now we have Timothy Prout, 1723 to 1741. Now this is a picture of his original stone. And here's a picture of a reproduction of his headstone. And the inscription reads, Here lies ye body of Timothy Prout, son of John Prout, Esquire, died September ye 12, 1741, in ye 19th year of his age, being a student at Yale College. I like the way they always put the word ye, Y-E, in there all the time. Next, we have John Punderson Sr., 1626 to 1681. 
and he came from Rowley Parish in Yorkshire, England, to Boston in 1637, and then moved to New Haven in 1639. And he was an original proprietor of New Haven and was one of the few chosen to be one of the seven pillars of the church. He was one of the few original proprietors of New Haven that stayed there until his death. Now we have Lydia Trowbridge Rosewell, 1666-1731. And let's notice that artwork on her headstone. Now we have Lydia Rosewell, and there's no dates for her. And I do not believe this is the same Lydia Trowbridge Rosewell that we just did. Next, we have Richard Rosewell, 1652 to 1702, and he was involved in trading in the East Indies. His headstone inscription reads, Here lieth the body of Mr. Richard Rosewell, who deceased March ye 24th, 1702, aged 50 years. Now we have John Roswell. We don't know when he was born, but he died in 1688. Now we have Esther Shipman, 1753 to 1781. And we have another Esther Shipman, and she was born in 1776 and died in 1793. She was the daughter of the previous Esther Shipman. Now we have Lieutenant Daniel Sperry, 1665 to 1750, and he was a lieutenant in the New Haven train band. Now we have Richard Sperry, 1606 to 1698, and he immigrated from England on the ship Hector to Boston, Massachusetts, 1637, and may have come may have come as an agent of the Earl of Warwick. He was in New Haven by 1643 as a farmer for Stephen Goodyear. He is famous for supplying food for the regicides, Whaley and Goff, while they were hiding at West Rock in the judge's cage, which adjoined Richard Sperry's property, which was called Sperry's Farms. Now we have Daniel Strobel, Jr., 1768 to 1839, and his wife, Anna Church Strobel. She was born in 1772, but we do not have a death date. Now we have Daniel Talmadge, 1711 to 1791. He was a miller at Hamden Court excuse me, at Hamden, Connecticut. When the British took New Haven, Connecticut on July 5th, 1779, he was captured by the British and taken to Long Island and later released. Now we have Anthony Thompson, 1614 to 1648. He is believed to have arrived in Boston on the ship Hector with two brothers, John and William, in 1637 in the company of Davenport and Eaton. He was a founder of Quinnipiac, of course that's New Haven, signing the fundamental agreement in New Haven on June 4, 1639. On July 1, 1644, he was administered the oath of fidelity by Theophilus Eaton, governor of New Haven Colony. And on March 10, 1646, Anthony Thompson was assigned the sixth row of the middle seats of the meeting house. Now we have Asa Todd, 1724 to 1779. He was on the muster roll of the 17th Military Company in the 2nd Regiment of Militia as a private, and he was killed in action when the British forces under General Tryon invaded New Haven on July 5, 1779. Now we have Charles Todd, 1734 to 1735. Next we have Daniel Todd, 1757 to 1794. His tombstone was moved to the Grove Street Cemetery. Next we have Eli Todd, 1767 to 1779. 
1731 to 1765, and he graduated from Yale College in 1751. Next, we have Mary Todd, 1737 to 1742. Next is Catherine Townsend, and we don't have any dates out at all on her. Next, we have Jeremiah Townsend, 1711 to 1803. Next is Caleb Trowbridge, 1670 to 1704. Next is Daniel Trowbridge, 1740 to 1742. And now we have another Daniel Trowbridge, 1784 to 1787. Next is Captain Daniel Trowbridge, 1703 to 1752. Now is Mrs. Elizabeth Bills Trowbridge, 1734 to 1777. John Trowbridge Jr., 1684 to 1740. Next is Captain Joseph Trowbridge, 1699 to 1763. Now is Mabel Brown Trowbridge, 1711 to 1797. Next is Mary Woodward Trowbridge, 1710 to 1771. Next we have Mary Winston Trowbridge, 1667 to 1742. Now as we have Sarah Dennison Trowbridge, 1708 to 1736. Now we have Sarah Rutherford Trowbridge, 1641 to 1687. And according to findagrave.com, this is the oldest stone in the crypt. Now we have Sarah Trowbridge, 1680 to 1690. Next is Sybil Trowbridge, 1782 to 1794. Next is Stephen Trowbridge, Jr., 1726 to 1796. Next we have another Sybil Trowbridge, she was born and died in 1778, and she was just one month old. And her sister, also named Sybil, uh, born 1779, died in 1781, and she was two years old. And they shared the same stone with her brother Daniel that we showed earlier. Next, we have Thankful Easton Trowbridge, 1687 to 1756. Thomas Trowbridge, 1663 to 1711. Next, we have Thomas Trowbridge, 1631 to 1702. And the inscription on his stone reads, Here lies interred the body of Thomas Trowbridge, Esquire, aged 70 years, deceased, de excuse me, deceased the 22nd of August, Anno Domini, which means worse in the year of our Lord, 1702. In case you didn't realize it, folks, the Trowbridge family was really prominent in this area. <laughs> Okay, next we have Roger Tyler, 1615 to 1673. Now the Tyler family originated in either England or Scotland. And this, and Roger Tyler came to America with the Saybrook Colony, now Old Saybrook in Middlesex County, Connecticut. He settled at Branford in the colony of New Haven, Connecticut. Branford had been purchased in December 1639 by the New Haven colonists from, and I'm going to, it's an Indian name, so I'm gonna, I know I'm going to butcher this, Momenquin Sakin of the local Indian tribe. In 1662, the various colonies banded together and obtained a charter from the King of England, making them the colony of 
Connecticut. Next, we have Captain John Wakeman, 1601 to 1661. And he signed the New Haven Compact in 1638. He was a deacon of the First Congregational Church in New Haven, served as treasurer of the Colony of New Haven, and was captain of the New Haven Train Band. <clears throat> in 1641, he was appointed magistrate of the court at New Haven several times between 1646 and 1660, he was chosen to represent New Haven at the General Court in Hartford. And he was chosen assistant in 1661, but he declined that offer. Next, we have the Reverend Samuel Wales, 1748 to 1794. Next, we have General Edward Whaley, 1606 to 1674. And he was an English military leader during the English Civil War and was one of the regicide who signed the death warrant of King Charles I. Whaley's grave with that of another of the regicides, John Dixwell, is in the center of the green in New Haven, Connecticut, close to the rear wall of the Congregational Church on the green or park. Rudely cut headstones of brown stone were placed to mark the graves and still remain, though nearly sunk in the soil, less than a foot above the ground. The only inscription visible is EW on one and JD on the other in large letters. And the descendants of John Dixwell have erected an appropriate monument and placed a fence around the burial plot. Next, we have Hannah Trowbridge Whiting, 1690 to 1748. Inscription on her stone says, Here lies interred the body of Mrs. Hannah, relic of the Honorable Colonel Joseph Whiting of New Haven, Esquire, who died August 9, 1748, aged 58 years. Next we have Joseph Whiting, 1645 to 1717. He was a merchant and treasurer of the colony from 1678 till his death in 1770, and died while he was attending the General Assembly of Hartford. Next, we have Colonel Joseph Whiting, 1681 to 1748. Now we have Sarah Ingersoll Whiting, 1726 to 1769. Next is Sarah Trowbridge Whiting, 1722 to 1793. And next we have the Reverend Chauncey Whittlesley, 1717 to 1787. And the plaque near the, the crypt reads he was, that he was a graduate of and instructor in Yale College, a member of the Colonial Assembly and in other public trusts from 1738 to 1758. And he was the fifth pastor of this church from 1758 to 1787. His piety and eloquence made him dear to his people and with his firmness and decision enabled him to discharge the duties of the pastoral office with fidelity and dignity during the struggle of the revolution. He died July 24th, 1787, in the 70th year of his age, and the 30th of his ministry. Now on his headstone, it reads, the, the stone marker near his crypt reads, to the memory of the Reverend Cha Chauncey Whittlesey, A.M., fifth pastor of the first church in this city, with eminent natural talents and human acquirements, he united a firm attachment to the principles of civil and religious liberty. He inculcated the doctrines of grace as motives to holiness, constantly taught and in various relations exemplified the more excellent way and, having discharged with fidelity and dignity the duties of the pastoral office, closed this useful life with the full hope of immortality. July 24th, 1787, in the 70th year of his age and 30th of his ministry. 
And then there's a quote from the book of Daniel, chapter 12 and verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine, shall shine as the brightest of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Next, we have Elisha, we'll see, 1751 to 1751, and he was just nine days old. Next, we have Elizabeth Whiting, Whittlesey, 1717 to 1751. Now we have Elizabeth Whittlesey, born and died in 1758, and she was only one month old. Next, we have Elizabeth Kerwood Whittlesey, 1800 to 1803. Next, we have John Bryant Whittlesey, 1761 to 1763. Next is Martha Newton Whittlesey, 1729 to 1812. And her headstone reads, To the memory of Martha Newton, wife of Reverend Chauncey Whittlesey, who died October 27th, 1812, aged 83. This was the last burial in the crypt, and her memory is missed. Next, we have Elizabeth Whittlesey, 17, born and died in 1760, and she was only eight weeks old. Next, we have Benjamin Wilmot Jr., 1610 to 1651, and he was one of the signers of the original compact or fundamental agreement at New Haven on June 4, 1639. Next, we have Captain William Walcott, 1730 to 1782. And according to Connecticut Church records, abstracts records, they have him dying February of 1782 in the Revolutionary War. Next, we have Samuel Wooding, 1747 to 1779. And he was on the muster roll of the 17th Military Company in the 2nd Regiment of Militia as a private. He was killed in action when the British forces under General Tryon invaded New Haven on July 5th, 1779, as was his brother, Silas Wooding. And here is his brother, Silas, 1750 to 1779. And of course, they were in the same uh, military unit, the 17th Military Company of the 2nd Regiment of Militia. And he was a private also. And he was killed, too, when uh, the British invaded New Haven on July 5th, 1779. And next, we have Elizabeth Woodward. We don't know when she was born, but she died in 1769. And last and certainly not least, we have Sarah Rosewell Woodward. We don't know when she was born, but she did die in 1720. Well, folks, we hope, hope you enjoyed this uh, historical video. Uh, when I first started this project, I, I didn't realize how many people were, I was going to be uh, talking about. But uh, it was a little bit of a challenge, but we got through it. And we hope you liked it. So please hit the like subscribe and share buttons. We really would appreciate it. Until we see it again, take care.